Hi, very nice to be here today. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about some work we've been doing on really stretching uh, genotyping and uh, imputation technology uh, to the max, you know, and we think this is going to be a really useful feature for almost all human genetic studies, and in particular for all those that uh, are starting with exome sequencing, but want to also have a look at the rest of the genome and want to have the best possible look in a cost-effective way. Uh, before I go into the details of the approach, I wanted to give you a little bit of context about why this was important to us and how we got there, uh, tell you a little bit about my day-to-day uh, -day work. So I always like to start by talking about what is the, the point, what's the goal of human genetic studies? You know, when people come to human genetics for many different reasons, uh, you know, some come to understand uh, relatedness and family history. Uh, I come to it uh, to understand biology. I think that uh, human genetics provides a very general purpose tool to understand almost any health trait or disease. And the uh, basic idea is that with that understanding, we can both uh, find the biological process that underlie a particular disease that will help us develop new treatments, new interventions. It also helps us make early decisions, uh, make predictions, uh, enable patients to start treatment earlier. Even when treatments are not available, people might want to be able to make decisions about their life uh, knowing what, what the risks ahead are for them. Uh, one of the big things that has happened in human genetics, if you look back over the past 20 years or so, is just uh, the scale and level of detail that's possible for these studies. Uh, in the early 2000s, we really were limited to looking at hundreds of samples uh, with uh, sometimes just a handful of genetic variants, uh, sometimes a little more. And then as technology improved, you get to a situation around you know, 2005 to 2010 where it's really started to be possible to look genome-wide, to look at uh, millions of genetic variants systematically capture all variation and this was really transformative you know in the early studies uh, where you could only look at a handful of variants you had to guess what are the right variants to measure what is the gene that's going to be key for this trait or this disease and we're not really great at making those guesses most most of them were off and uh, most of these studies were not super satisfying or super enlightening as you know once started going genome-wide, you know, the pace of discovery really, really accelerated. You know, and it's continued to accelerate, you know, um, in part because of uh, uh, sequencing, in part because improvements in array technology, in part because of automation that really lets us look at uh, larger and larger sample sizes. You know, there's a, a number of projects ongoing uh, where my expectation is that soon, you know, maybe in the next year or so, you know, you'll start looking at data sets that have not just hundreds of millions of genetic variants, but really billions of genetic variants. On my day-to-day um, -day work, I'm at the Regeneron Genetics Center. Uh, I'm uh, in charge of uh, analytical genetics and data science there. And, uh, you know, there's a, a number of interesting things we're doing. You know, so we're collecting human genetic data at scale. We have... Uh, exome sequence data at the moment on a little bit over one and a half million people. Uh, we are, you know, working with many, many partners to figure out, you know, what are opportunities to combine that sort of genetic data with really complete and informative health data and relevant, you know, so some of our big partnerships that uh, you, you might have heard about are with Geisinger or with UK Biobank. But there really are a ton of there. There's over 90 research partners. We, we just started a pretty large 100,000 person plus collaborations with the University of Colorado, uh, with uh, UCLA, uh, and others. Um, you know, we, we take this data, try to make sense of it, combine the genetics with the health information, make discoveries that point to specific genes, you know, and then we, we have a, a regular process where we're, we're just talking with everybody else at Regeneron. And most of these other folks are not experts in genetics, they're experts in drug development, but they're really uh, 
engaged and, and really keen to find the best opportunities and, and take them on further into the uh, drug development process. You know, and I, I would say, you know, we have probably over 10, probably well over 10, you know, drug development discovery programs that started from genetic evidence. Uh, if you wanted to see a, a prototypical example of what we're trying to accomplish, you know, here's a little example. On the, on the left, you have a, a clear genetic association signal. This is measured as a, a log of the p-value uh, for evidence for association across a, a region with several genes. One little gene in the middle is called ANGPTL3. There's many, many common variants. They all show up in a, in a particular haplotype that show a strong association signal there. And uh, over time, as we've looked more deeply in this region and across the genome, uh, one of the interesting discoveries was that uh, individuals who have um, loss of function, who have a, a knockout in the ANGPTL3 gene, have, uh, you know, pretty drastic changes in their cholesterol profile and in some sense changes that appear uh, quite appealing. They have much lower triglycerides, they have lower LDL, they have lower uh, total cholesterol uh, and that's the table on the right. The table is really tiny but I, I just wanted to make the point that these changes are quite rare. In this particular example out of about 45,000 individuals we found 190 that had these knockout variants you know, and the ANGPTL3 is probably a gene where knockout uh, loss of function variants are relatively common. Uh, you know, since making these observations, we actually started uh, development of uh, an antibody that would block ANGPTL3, and we've since, uh, you know, actually been able to carry out human trials and show, you know, really uh, appealing benefits uh, for individuals with. Um, familial hypercholesterolemia that with other treatments still have cholesterol levels that are you know far too high and that are at high risk of heart disease and so obviously we'd like to do this not just for ANGPL3 but for every gene in the genome and we'd like to be able to combine the different sources of evidence not just the uh, you know rare knockout variants which you'd get by exome sequencing but also the common variation uh, around there, which we typically get through uh, genotyping arrays. Okay, here's a, another example. This one at a uh, somewhat larger scale. This is a collaboration with uh, several other uh, biopharmaceutical companies. They're listed there. Uh, and the uh, UK Biobank, where a few years ago we set out to sequence everybody, all 500,000 UK Biobank participants. This is a, an amazing data set. There's really extensive data on each participant from uh, blood and serum biomarkers to uh, brain and whole body images to extensive questionnaires uh, to samples that have been banked for future um, analysis and, and, uh, and uh, data generation. Here's just a sort of a taste of what's possible. Uh, this is in the first uh, you know, 150,000 exomes, uh, when those were sequenced uh, uh, at some point early last year. And you can see that uh, there's a, a range of uh, association signals. Uh, I'll point out, for example, in the top row, uh, individuals who had um, loss of function variance in PKD2 uh, were at uh, about, if you go over to the odds ratio, call about a thousand fold increased risk of um, uh, kidney disease and you can see that you know we had something like uh, 39 carriers in the entire sample 24 of those fell in the 140,000 controls and 15 fell in the 85 cases very very strong you know and as you as you look through that list you'll find many other sort of striking examples these are sorted by effect size so as you go down the list you'll see somewhat smaller effects. So for example, near the bottom, you'll see that uh, variants in myosillin increase risk of glaucoma or NOS3 increasing risk of blood pressure or filaggrin atopic dermatitis. You know, and closer to the top, you'll see PKD1 and PKD2 with polycystic kidney disease. You'll see things like uh, 
call 1A1 with uh, bone disorders. I think these are all you know, well-established sort of uh, positive controls, but they, they just speak to the power of the approach. And uh, in a data set where you have very systematic health data and now have this sequence data, you have the opportunity to look for many different uh, genetic signals. I wanted to uh, show a, another interesting example from UK Biobank, this one uh, looking at uh, lifespan. And, and this one uh, you know, illustrates the value of basically having the genome uh, and the exome together. You know, in this case, we have both common variants near APOE uh, that uh, are very, have been associated with longevity many times. And in this case, among UK Biobank participants who carry them, we see that their, uh, their parents, their mothers, uh, had that lifespan about three months shorter. And then we see uh, rare uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 variants that in this case have quite a dramatic impact on lifespan, about five years shorter in, in the lifespan of their parents. Uh, just uh, just to show that you know you, you need to look in, at the right people and the right context in, in addition to having the right genomic assay or, or you know or the results could be quite different and, and this is the same UK Biobank participants but now looking at the father's age at death instead of the mother's age at death and you see that the profile is quite a bit different you know APOE the, this gene that uh, is the prototypical, aging associated gene that uh, everybody knows about is still there, still associated with about three month change in lifespan. But then the other genes that are coming up are completely different than what we saw in mothers. You know, we have a smoking locus on uh, chromosome 15. You have uh, loci associated with um, uh, heart disease uh, near CDKN2B and LPA and so on, you know, very, very striking. Okay, what, what makes these sorts of studies possible? You know, and obviously, one of the things that makes them possible is uh, fantastic colleagues in the lab. Uh, you know, we have uh, a fantastic lab team. They run a number of sequencers, and they've really invested in automation. And we now have the capacity to do uh, well over 500,000 exomes a year. And we've certainly, uh, you know, exceeded that number uh, in, in the last, uh, uh, you know, year and, and expect to do that again in the year ahead. Um, the other thing that uh, that's important is, is to really keep pushing on the analysis side and keep innovating. I, I love this uh, little image uh, from uh, Lewis Carroll's original book uh, with the Red Queen and, and, and her saying that, you know, you, you just have to run as much as you can to just stay in the same place. You know, and with data growing, as you saw in that table early in the presentation, uh, and, and uh, number of variants growing, number of sample size growing. We just need super efficient analysis methods. You know, for example, we're very lucky uh, to have uh, colleagues like uh, Joel and Jonathan who, who developed this Regini engine that's the workhorse for our association analysis. And uh, the, the reason to bring this up was just to say that, you know, as we thought about what is necessary to scale even further, what is necessary to continue to doing these large, high-quality experiments, you know, it's a combination of working with folks in the lab and figuring out what is it that we can automate, what is it that we can run at scale, and it's a combination of working with uh, folks like uh, Jonathan and Joel, who are actually, uh, you know, together with a few others that I'll name at the end, uh, very intimately involved in this project, you know, coming up with good ways to make sense of the data, good ways to, to really design the experiment. And so let's get to the meat of it. Um, you know, as we've been uh, thinking about scaling, not just to 500,000 samples a year, but to a million samples a year and beyond that, it was clear that uh, processing arrays was, uh, was a big uh, kind of bottleneck for us. Uh, in addition, in addition to being a bottleneck, uh, processing arrays and, and the current array technologies we thought were a little bit suboptimal. They do not really work as well as we'd like across all the different ancestries, across all the diversity of uh, samples and populations uh, that we'd like to study. Um, and so we, we tried to figure out, is, is there a better way? Is there a way to really get better quality results and to have a process that in the lab 
uh, was uh, as easy to scale as, as we found exome sequencing to be. Um, you know, in some sense, we thought this is a problem that was was ripe for a little innovation. Genotyping technologies have really been mostly unchanged for almost 20 years. Uh, arrays work well, and, and they're relatively low cost, but they're still very labor intensive. They're still not uh, where you'd like a technology that's really scalable to be. Um, they also require extra equipment. You know, we have uh, a, a really nice sequencing pipeline, but here we'd need to use, you know, special equipment just to run the arrays, just to process them, just to get them prepped. Um, and so we, we tried to design a, a sequencing-based genotyping approach, like from the ground up, that was really designed for uh, using in capture settings, uh, that was not picking variants one at a time as was done for arrays, but that really took into account that, uh, you know, when you are capturing a little piece of DNA, you might have the opportunity to capture m multiple variants that come together. And so we re redesigned the tagging strategy to take that into account, to pick optimal fragments to capture, and to really try and do that in a way that worked very well across uh, different ancestries. So if I was going to describe our approach in words, that's what this slide tries to do, I'd say, you know, we ended up putting together a, a unique algorithm that takes uh, variants to represent everything else across the genome. Uh, we try to both uh, maximize what we're capturing, the tagging, but also to say, you know, let's pack this into as few capture targets as possible so that we have an efficient process on the sequencing side. Uh, you know, we start with a design, we then ended up working with our lab colleagues, uh, running it on a few samples, uh, tweaking the design, and, uh, and running it again. Uh, you know, we think the approach is, is really designed to work across a wide variety of ancestries. It was completely agnostic uh, how we went about it. We didn't favor uh, samples of European ancestry or Asian ancestry or anywhere else. We, we have a, a pretty much equally balanced set of samples from around the world and said, you know, let's represent all the variation they have. Uh, in our current uh, design, we target uh, about one 0.4 million common variant sites, and these include both the sites selected for tagging and a set of high-value variants that we thought were really important to include, whether they were known um, genetic association signals from the GWAS catalog uh, or the HLA region or pharmacogenetic variants, and then tiling of the mitochondria. And uh, as, you, as you will have heard, you know, we're really working hard with Twist to make this a, a product that's available off the shelf to anybody. And now, that was in words, and I think sometimes uh, a picture is a bit more clear. And so I'll, I'll try and, and, and do it as a cartoon. Imagine that you're looking at a series of genomes, uh, you know, from many different samples. Uh, in each one, I've... Uh, shaded little boxes to say these are the coding regions, these are the exons of genes, and then little circles in different colors to represent genetic variants. Now if we focus on a single one of these samples, uh, you could imagine a standard exome sequencing uh, process where we are selecting little short fragments of DNA and sequencing them on top of each of the exons. And what we're really doing here is selecting, in addition, some of the variants that fall outside genes and adding reads on top of them. And this is a, a capture process that can be run in parallel and at the same time as the whole exome sequencing. How does this work? So we have here a, a little bit of uh, first pass results and I'll show you a little bit more, more detailed assessment taking into account imputation in a minute. Uh, but in the first row, genotyping by sequencing, the reads that we captured just run through a standard variant caller, looking at the 1.38 million sites uh, that we're targeting. And you'll see that this standard caller called 98.9% .9 of sites, but had you know only kind of middling concordance, 94%. And that's because sometimes in these capture assays, the coverage is a little low. Now, in the second row, the same genotype by sequencing experiment, but now with 
multi-point refinement, really you know, smarter analysis methods that look at the combination of variants in each read. Does, do they fit the haplotype that we expect? And also at you know, neighboring reads. Now, using those methods, you can improve call rate a little bit, 98.99%. And you can greatly improve uh, concordance, you know, now up to 99.8%, which is really comparable to what you get with arrays, with the caveat that arrays would typically target fewer sites instead of 1.4 million. You know, GSA array, for example, targets about 560,000 sites. That these sites would not be as well selected to capture genetic variation, uh, and that. It's just a smaller number of sites, so you have to do more work when you come to the next step, which is to use imputation to carry it, to capture all common variation across the genome. So in this slide, you know some assessment of how well we're doing here in the red line in comparison to the mega array, you know, which is kind of a, a gold standard uh, genotyping array, a, a bit larger, a bit more expensive, a bit more cumbersome to run, less convenient for multiplexing. And in blue, the GSA, which is you know one of the workhorse arrays that's uh, most widely used at the moment. And you can see that our performance is very, very close uh, to the mega in this analysis, and also you know in, in our hands for a cost that's uh, substantially uh, lower uh, to the uh, GSA array. I made the point that uh, this worked uh, well across ancestries, and so here's another comparison. Uh, in blue, uh, the GSA, you know, and then in red, and in brown, and they're really superimposed, uh, an assessment of how well uh, our strategy is doing and how well the MEG is doing in individuals of African ancestry. And you can see we're doing really, really well. And if you... Uh, peek at the bottom right of the slide, you know, I think one of the, the reasons, one of the reasons for the weakness of the GSA and some other arrays when you move between populations and you try and capture diverse samples is that they were really too focused on um, European specific variants. You know, there's, there's a couple of million um, variants that are really unique to the thousand genomes uh, uh, African ancestry samples, for example, these variants are very common there and rare everywhere else in the world. In our reagent, you know, we ended up capturing about 250,000 of those. The mega only really measures 100,000 of these, and the GSA only has 3,000. And when you really don't have very many, then you have to do a lot of work and sometimes impossible work to capture the haplotype variation there and to impute the rest of the variations so a portion of the evolutionary tree where you don't have uh, really good data okay so just to wrap up and summarize you know I told you that we've developed a, a sequencing based alternative to genotyping arrays better coverage of the genome than than standard arrays across multiple ancestries we're currently asking about 1.4 million common variants that they were selected to be very useful for imputation across many ancestries. And that we've uh, tested this reagent, uh, iteratively improved it, you know, and actually now have it in production. Uh, so it's now, uh, you know, for, for the next 500,000 um, exomes that we'll be sequencing, our plan is that they will all go through this technology, for example. Uh, the data can be generated in tandem to whole exome sequencing, so this really simplifies lab processes. Uh, it includes, in addition to common uh, variant tags, uh, a number of things to represent known association peaks, the mitochondria, pharmacogenetic variants, the MHC, etc. Uh, one really nice feature that we're hoping to uh, spend more time tuning and tweaking is that we can you know, just like in exome sequencing with our parallel genotype by sequencing, we say, you know, we, we need to capture every new variant in the exome because they could be so important and they could be these loss of function variants that we don't want to miss. And we say, you know, we'll go a little deeper on the exome than on these common variant uh, clusters. Uh, it's actually possible at the level of individual variants or individual genes to tweak coverage. If there's a, 
a variant that was super important for pharmacogenetic or any other reason, we could say, let's pile up a few more reads just for that variant. So we have not just 99.8% genotype accuracy, but 99.99% or whatever our target is and, and go for that. I've showed you data to show that the genotypes are very, very high fidelity. Uh, and I didn't mention this, but I think it's important that, you know, this really adds very modest uh, processing time to every sample. You know, we're still working on optimizing this further, but at the moment we're talking about less than uh, 10 minutes of uh, computer time for each exome that's processed and each sample can be um, handled independently on a pipeline that's really based on open tools and reference data. So I want to thank many of my Regenerator and, and Twist colleagues, and I think that's it for today. Thank you.